Live from SABC Studios in Auckland Park, Johannesburg, welcome to this midweek edition of The Watchdog. My name is William Vogo, and on the show this evening... We are approaching Mr. Uh, the, the president because the president knows about this issue, but he has opted not to acknowledge it and or address it. Another shame visits the nation as scores of HIV positive women are forcefully sterilized or coerced to do so. Now have nowhere to turn to as politicians and government officials are nowhere to be found. Outrage continues following the release today of Chris Anna's killer. Polish immigrant Janusz Walusz. We bring you those reactions before our analysts for this evening look ahead at what other processes uh, may bring to this whole issue. The Watchdog starts now. One of the victims of forced sterilization left beyond broken. She recalled the devastating effects the injustice has on her life. She's also one of many women left with severe complications. 15 years after her ordeal, she's still experiencing excruciating pain. In one instance, her husband was beating her with a chair, a dining room chair, you know, because she felt the husband hated her so much. Another victim also shared her trauma and how her bodily integrity was allegedly violated by the state. I can safely say that was the first time I experienced a depression <sighs> to its full extent. I became suicidal. The organization, Her Rights Initiative, is currently representing 85 women of all ages across the country who have been victims of reproductive violence. Most of the victims were never given proper information about the sterilization process. Some were allegedly forced. The advocacy group says they all deserve justice and proper compensation. Mr. President, please assist us in this manner. And I would share this with members of the press, you know, that we are approaching Mr. Uh, the, the president because the president knows about this issue, but he has opted not to acknowledge it and or address it. They also called for free mental health services to all victims and for the president to hold the health minister accountable as he's allegedly been downplaying the incidents. It is an absolute travesty and an injustice that not only requires but absolutely demands more than just an apology. It demands restitution and for the state and its representatives to be held accountable for the trauma they have inflicted. The group called for stronger and immediate accountability against unscrupulous and negligent medical practitioners. Meanwhile, the advocacy group also emphasized that the number of victims have since doubled in the last eight years, a clear indication that the practice is still rife and perhaps underreported. Patricia Fasahi, SBC News, in Johannesburg. Now, with a kind of history, that uh, black South Africans in particular had to endure under apartheid. The last thing you would uh, want to hear of is a story of what amounts to a mass sterilization program of black women at state-owned health facilities, Nohal, with no one among the authorities owning up to this. Uh, almost two years after a chapter nine institution, the Commission for Gender Equality compiled a comprehensive report on the matter and handed it to the government. No one from the state wants to even touch this subject. And today, as you saw there, uh, the 85 HIV positive women were forced or coerced to sterilize, wrote an open letter to the president of South Africa. My first guest, Lindy Mashangu, is one of them. 
she was coerced into removing her womb. Also part of this conversation is Stembi Somtembu. She is the co-founder of an organization called Hair Rights Initiative, which has been working with the women, with the women in this year's long battle. We did approach the National Department of Health. No one uh, was available for today or tomorrow, not even on Friday. But hey, the conversation is going to go on. Ladies, good evening. Thanks to both of you for agreeing to come on the program. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Vigo. Vigo for inviting Melinda, I don't even know where um, to begin, you know. Um, perhaps uh, we can go back and uh, you can um, very briefly just take us through like that the very first time you went to hospital and what you were asked, what you were told and what happened subsequently. Um, good, good evening everyone, uh, the viewers at home, I'm Lindrua Mashango. Um, I think when I was um, started to take the ARVs um, because my CD4 count was 20. So as you know that when your CD4 count is, 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 is in compromised in that manner, so many things uh, in your body is, is compromised as well. So um, I was referred to a hospital where I had some uh, experiences in, in, in my womb. So when I get to the hospital, um, they've done some tests and then the doctor told me that I need to choose between HIV and cancer because um, um, I was diagnosed with cancer as well. well. Then it happened that it was 2009 where they couldn't do any operations by that time since my CD4 count was less than 20 and um, they had to operate me when my CD4 count is above 200. It took for two years for my CD4 count to, to raise to that amount where the hospital needed to be. Then in 2011, the doctor confirmed that I need to be sterilized because uh, I can live with two diseases. Okay, um, then it happened uh, because um, when someone tells you about Cancer, we all know that, um, all you think it's, it's, it's dying. Mm. So I needed to survive for, 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 for some reason. Because by that time in 2011, um, we, 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 I, I started ARVs. I know that, that with ARVs I can prolong my life. But with the cancer, I didn't know anything. And for that two years, I didn't get any form of um, information even to be told that what um, the, 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 the challenges that I'm going to face with after doing that sterilization. And then when I met Promise, um, yeah, she met us where we, we had so many issues um, because we have lost so many things like we, we, are, we are experiencing sanitary dignities, um, we can't even uh, go on with our lives. Remember that. Um, uh, sorry, Mama. We, just, just briefly. Who promise, Ubani? Who's promise? Promise in table. The one with you on the oh, on okay. the street. Table is a promise in table. Yes. All right. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, sorry, continue. Promise in table, yes. Promise in table was doing the awareness to find all the women. So um, I was one of those women, and then we started doing the the campaign where we needed other women. So yes, um, we at that time, we all, I was so sick, I was so sick. And this, the sterilization that was done to me, it was in a bad way because even in 2017, I had to go back to the hospital for, that, for the operation to be uh, done again. Because yeah, I'm so, yeah. So promise took us, uh, we were 27 by that time, and then we grow to 48, 
as now we are 85. Mm. Yeah, so... Did, were you at any point told um, what to expect? In other words, what would be the, the consequences of whatever decision you, you, you had to take so that you take an informed decision um, and, and, and not uh, based on uh, whatever assumptions uh, you may have had uh, with whatever knowledge you may have had at the, at the time. In other words, did they say that um, if you make this choice, this is what is going to, these are the benefits but with those benefits comes, you know, what you will have to forego, pain. Maybe, you, you know, over the years, things will never be the same again. Were you taken on uh, the journey that uh, you will have to travel, then following whatever decision you will have made? Nothing was done. Nothing was done for you. As I'm, I'm saying that, um, they've diagnosed me in 2009 with the cancer, as they were saying that I had a stage 2 cancer. Then in 2011, that was two years, and they had a lot of time in their hands to take me through to that, and even to let me be aware of the consequences that I'm going to face for my life. But they never did. They never did. In a way that uh, after what they've done to me, I've done my own research. I find out that sterilization uh, in a cancer is the last stage to be considered. There are other options that they were supposed to take me through it, mm. but they never did that. Instead, they took the last decision, which was sterilized. Mm. They wanted me to be sterilized. Because of what? I, I was supposed to choose between HIV and the cancer. That was the doctor told me. And this, this goes to the nub of the problem, promise, yes, doesn't it? <laughs> yes. Uh, because yes. these people, I mean, were under the pretext, you know, of preserving their lives or doing the best for them. Uh, someone, it looks like, deliberately withheld uh, information or at the very least negligently, uh, I mean, decided not to take them through what um, they will have to undergo, what it means, the consequences uh, for them, so that they do what some of us are able to do because, you know, we can afford to do that, which is to, to then decide, n not have someone else deciding for you. Yes, yeah. <clears throat> yes, indeed. Uh, and thanks, Lindy, for, for, for sharing. Um, we, we've worked this journey with Lindy for quite some time. Uh, and what Lindy is describing is just one form uh, of forced sterilizations of HIV positive women, uh, where, as she says, that you know the doctor would imagine that you'll have cancer, you know, at some point, um, you know, and decides to remove your womb without telling you what is it, is it about and without giving you the formal uh, diagnosis uh, of uh, cancer, you know. So it's just one. And the bulk uh, of the women we represent of the age of 85 are women who had their tubes cut, their tubes cut and removed, and in some instances their entire uterus removed. Um, and this happened, uh, happens, um, you know, mainly in antenatal services or where women, you know, deliver their babies, right? Uh, so you'll have an HIV positive woman, you know, who go to a clinic hospital to deliver. Um, and uh, um, like in the early 2000s to mid 2000s, the policy or the clinical guideline was that HIV positive men should have C-section birth as part of the PMTCT program. You know, and we find that a PMCT lot of women, yeah. Prevention were of mother to child transmission. Yes, yeah. A lot of women were sterilized uh, at that time, you know, because, you know, the doctors suddenly had access to women's wombs and. Mm -hmm you know, tubes, um, and most of the cohort of women we represent from that period actually did not know that they'd been sterilized um, until they, you know, had a complication or they wanted to conceive again and started to consult and realize that actually you are not conceiving because you've been sterilized. Is that legal even? Are doctors allowed to, that, to do that? 
No, it is not legal uh, because it is forced sterilization. And obviously some women would sign the consent form, but you sign the consent form because you are picked from labor ward, like in you know, quite advanced labor, and you are taken to theater because you had a red sticker, you have a red sticker that you have HIV, you know, so you are in a way forced. And sometimes women would sign for sterilization on the operating table, you know, and sometimes you deliver through C-section and when you wake up, then you be told, oh yeah, you've given birth to a healthy bouncing baby boy. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, that's what we have matters sterilized to you, you at the time. Yeah, mm. well, well, yeah, we've sterilized mm. you, congratulations, yeah. So that's one way. It is not legal, you know, obviously. Uh, you've mentioned the Commission for Gender Equality um, uh, report. report. Um, you know, and, and we have to say that we went to the Commission for Gender Equality after trying to work with the state for six years without success. You know, and in that six years, the only success we really achieved, um, so 2009 up to 2015, is that the Kautek Provincial Department of Health settled one case uh, of the women who represented out of court, right? So that was one gain. So we went to the Commission for Gender Equality to complain, lodge a formal complaint on behalf of 48 women. The CGE investigated over five years, and they found, I'm, I'm going to the point about illegality, mm -hmm. that the state violated 26 of our human rights, 26 rights were violated. So the right to body in, in integrity, you know, the right you know, to choose, um, you know, the right to sexual and reproductive health. And the main, the main violation they committed mm. was that, um, you know, basically the women were subjected to torturous, inhumane, degrading punishment. You know, so torture is the highest level of human rights violation. Mm -hmm. So the women we represent now are not just HIV positive women who were forced into sterilization, mm -hmm. but they are HIV positive women who are victims of torture. I mean, I mean, it, in, in their report, they list, you know, sort of the uh, health consequences, the dangers um, uh, of, of, of this practice. And this, I mean, in a, in a constitutional democracy, I mean, our constitution, I mean, we talk about this every day and, uh, you know, about how it is being hailed as one of the best in the world. And hence, I started uh, by, uh, where I started that you would never have thought that um, in a country like ours, with the history we have, a black woman would be forced to, would be, uh, whether it's coerced, actually forced to, to, to sterilize, that something like that would, 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 would ever happen. Well, anyway, I mean, your, your, have you been able to um, recover, you know, from, 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 from the effects of uh, uh, what you went through? Or is it something you have to, though, you, you're now going to have to leave with, um, um, you know, everything until? I've, I've never recovered, uh, Vuyo, because, um, for an example, what, what was done to me, it was a mess in my body, first of all. Secondly, um, living with HIV, it's a, it's a process on its own. Mm. And um, for you to be in a black society where you need to be accepted, yet you, you don't have a womb as a woman, it, that's, that's worse. Yes, I can disclose my status, which um, I'm living with, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm openly living with HIV. But with my womb, it's something else, Buyo. Remember that we've been called by names um, even before when we grow up. We know that if a woman is married and she can't bear uh, kids, that woman will be called by names. Mm. So imagine in, in our situation where there are women who was um, forced sterilized at the age of 20, and they were not even told. Those women, some of them, they got into marriages where they don't even know that they can't have kids. When their husbands find out, they, they are divorced now. They've been thrown out of their homes. They are homeless. The kids are suffering. As in my life, um, it's a mess as where even when I, I want to move on with my life, I can't because I'm thinking of, disclosing my status to a person, 
then I have to come again and tell that person to say, I don't have a womb. Imagine. Mm. So it's a trauma where even if, if, if you want to think about it, you always have, have those um, hot flashes. Like you are all, you, you, every day, it's a, it's a daily trauma. Yeah, even if we want to accept it, Vuyo, it's difficult. I, I don't want to lie to you. It's difficult um, because when I've done a research, um, after I think when I've made promise about the, um, what they've done to us, it is a plea to death because when someone is sterilized, her life is cut into short. Uh, remember, those things are, are, are forming cloth in our blood and they go straight to our uh, to our uh, to, to our vein system where they they have blockage now. So if God has given me eighty five years to live, my life has cut into fifty years. I can't live longer than God expected me to live. Mm. What have been uh, the government's responses? I mean, apart from the cases they've had to settle, which um, you 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 mentioned, have there been constant? engagements about what their attitude is towards this, how they plan to help um, these women, what happens in the future, has the practice even stopped? Do we know if the practice has stopped? You know, ha ha have they be have said anything to you? Well, they wouldn't speak to us today. Um, okay, so the state has not been responsive at all, you know, which is quite disappointing, you know, but which, you know, is something that does not, you know, shock us, you know, in any way because... Like nothing at all, not even saying uh, maybe we should meet or then you meet and then someone says something that doesn't really go anywhere and nothing. Yeah, okay, I'll get into that. Um, yeah, because I, I think the state does not value the lives and bodies uh, of black uh, poor women, you know, and, you know, my suggestion is that you know, the best constitution we're talking about is probably not applicable mm -hmm. uh, to black poor women uh, in this particular country. You know, and there's another conversation about like who defines best. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so we basically went to the Commission for Gender Equality because we tried to engage the state to no avail. And the Commission uh, for Gender Equality, um, they came up with recommendations. Uh, and one of the recommendation, recommendation 12.4 was, um, you know, that the state must engage with the victims, you know, so that they find, you know, each other in as far as redress is concerned, right? Uh, and then the state, you know, started the process without us and our legal representatives, which is the Women's Legal Center. Uh, so HRI and Women's Legal Center represent the 85 women, you know, and we heard about this committee that the state, um, you know, had set up to look into the report, look into the recommendations, you know, and I have to remind you Vuyo, that um, when the CGE issued the report, um, the state did not respond to the CGE and they only responded when the CGE placed them on Mora. You know, the seven days that you respond, oh, yeah. Um, you know, so we began to question, you know, the committee, how it was formulated, what is its mandate, you know, and so on and so forth. We sent a 14 letter uh, 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 to letter. the department, yes, yeah, through our lawyers, the Women's Legal Center. The state did not respond to the letter. Instead, they decided to call the victims into a meeting with the committee. And that was in June 2021. Um, and we were hoping that they would respond, you know, to, to the questions, you know, but the conversation was different, right? Mm -hmm. You know, but we had the conversation. Um, and, uh, you know, the outcome was that they would report because we wanted the committee to be expanded. Um, you know, they'd offered a counseling, which, a, a package which included counseling, you know, reversals of sterilizations to the women of a particular age, certain uh, hormone, and also subject to availability of funds. Mm -hmm. Because remember, the government policy does not offer fertility clinic, fertility treatment as, 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 as yet. So women needed to wait for that. You know, but look at the women like myself and Lindy, where we are sterilized when we are 20 years old, and we are now 45 years old, you know. You know, and the state kind of decides, you know, that this is what is good for you. You do not want to have children anymore. Mm -hmm. Your husband, you've lost the husband. You do not have energy to, you know, run around chasing a three-year-old, as you would say. You know, and the question was, if you break my arm, you know, you do not come back 20 years later 
and you say, I want to fix your arm, you know. And actually, if the law says I'm a victim of torture, you know, international law and regional law is very clear, you know, on how you deal with compensation in as far as victims of torture are concerned. Um, you know, and then back to this committee. So we last heard or saw the committee in June 2021. So the state has not res responded. Um, you know, and our lawyers have sent like a pre-order of letters to the state to no avail. Mm -hmm. And this is why now we have written this open letter mm -hmm. to the state president. We want him to intervene to address this particular matter. Have you had access to, uh, you know, knowledge, new or old, uh, uh, for that matter? I mean, we're like experts from the our country, but even beyond, uh, who can advise you on possibilities. Because, uh, I mean, for victims to be locked in a room uh, with people who obviously have vested interests, who would want to contain this as much as they can, uh, you know, may not take you where uh, knowledge, technology, whatever, advances of whatever nature, um, uh, you know, uh, may be found. Mm. You mean... Um, Have um, you had you, people assisting you, like, in this uh, journey with uh, knowledge? Expertise. That may, yeah, expertise that may equip you, you know? Oh, yes, yeah, um, indeed. Um, yeah, oh, yes, indeed. We started to, you know, organize after engaging the Department of Health. And the response, you know, from the department at the time was that you are coming with women's stories here, you know, and we do not act on the basis uh, of stories. You know, then we organized and went to the University of Kwazulu Natal and ask them to assist us in conducting a study, a descriptive study, you know, of how, what forced sterilization looks like uh, in South Africa. So we worked with an institution called HEAD and the UKZN School of Law, you know, and then that study, it was the first of its kind in the world, you know, then informed all the work that followed, you know, thereafter. We have our legal partners, the Women's Legal Centre, you know, and also the HIV positive women who are part of this, you know, most of them are, people who have lived with HIV for a long time, you know, studied, you know, others up to PhD level, you know, kind of moved on, you know, and they've come back, you know, and they are expert themselves, you know, and we obviously do have medical advisors who advise us uh, on matters, um, you know, medical, you know, so the decisions and the actions we take um, are very informed. You know, we recently started to do international, you know, advocacy, you know, sort of building um, on, on the CGE report and have, you know, uh, international advocacy partners. I mean, for an example, last year, we filed a shadow report to the United Nations uh, Committee Committee on the Elimination of All Forms of Violence, of, violence, of discrimination rather, against women. Because this targets women, young women, black, reproductive age, uh, who use public hospitals, therefore poor. It does not target women of other races, and it indeed does not target HIV-positive men. Mm. You know, so the committee found in our favor and instructed South Africa to immediately stop sterilizing HIV-positive men mm. and amend the law. And this was coming from the fact that the first case we have on our file is of a woman who was sterilized in 1999, mm. and the latest case we have on our file is of a young woman who was sterilized Before. in 2021, mm. in May 2021, and she's 22 years old now. Uh, you know, so the, the, you know, so it's it's that CEDO report uh, with recommendations. The special rapporteur uh, on health, who happens to be South African, Dr. Tlaleng uh, Mufuking, mm -hmm. you know, in her report where she was reporting about racism in relation to health, you know, touched on this issue that it is, you know, a matter of concern that the intersections of race and mm -hmm. poverty mm -hmm. and HIV status exposes HIV-positive women mm -hmm. to this. And at the beginning of November, on the 16th of November, South Africa was reporting to the United Nations uh, peer review uh, process, which is about South Africa reporting to the UN as to the progress they are making in implementing the International Declaration, Declaration on Human Rights. Mm -hmm. you know, and the question was asked about forced sterilizations of HIV positive women. You know, so at a UN international level, what was the answer? South Africa. Huh? They have not responded. Okay. We, we are waiting okay. for the answer. We are watching it very closely. You okay. know, and, but, oh, yeah. You know, I, I, I mean, we have run out of time and we've barely scratched the surface of, uh, of, of, of this, but we are going to get into it. 
uh, um, um, in fact, sooner rather than later. Just the one thing, if there was someone out there in a position of power, authority, who may have listened to your story and listened to what promises had to say, the efforts all of you <clears throat> have been busy with uh, over the years, what, what is the one thing that you would say um, to that person? Say they have the... Uh, ability or are in a unique position where they can influence decisions uh, right now around this issue. What's the one thing you would you would urge them to do? Um, I would say, um, um, can they uh, respect uh, black poor women? Because at the end of the day, we are humans and we we need to be respected in our community and we need to live our life to the fullest. And as Promise is saying that um, our main issue or our main aim is to make sure that no one um, who's living with HIV as a black uh, poor woman is being sterilized. Because after HIV, there is life. It's not that we are HIV, we don't have life. So um, I would plead to them to say, can even now, come come to on board with us to come and listen to us mm. so that they can hear our 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 miserable stories because they don't want to meet with us mm. if they can come and meet, meet, meet with us and hear our our miseries because we are miserable honestly we are and we need them to come and 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 feel our pain mm. because we are in pain Linda Mashang, Sam Simtemble, thank both of you for coming through um, and sharing your stories and your journey with us. And as I was saying earlier, we've barely scratched the surface. Uh, in fact, very soon I'm going to ask you to please come back and we'll try and continue with this conversation. Um, hopefully with the people who can actually answer some of the questions all of us are asking, having heard what you had to say. But we're going to leave it there for tonight. After the break, the release today of Chris and his killer, Janos Wallace, sparks more outrage. Janos Schwalus has officially walked out of prison. In a statement, Justice and Correctional Services Minister Ronald Lamola says he has placed Wallace on parole under strict conditions with effect from today. The killer of Communist Party General Secretary Chris Ani's release is in line, Lamola said, with a recent decision by the Constitutional Court. Possimampuru Correctional Facility it has been Wallace's home for the past 29 years. Last month, the Constitutional Court ordered the release of Chris Hani's Polish killer on parole. And Chief Justice Raymond Zondo left parole conditions to the Justice Minister to decide. A week after the ruling, Wallace was stabbed by another inmate while queuing for food. His release was delayed while he received medical treatment. Now he's been discharged from hospital and is no longer within the four walls of the prison cell. The Minister of Justice and Correctional Services, Ronald Lamola, has placed offender Yanus Walush on parole under strict conditions. This follows the judgment of the Constitutional Court on the 21st of November, 2022. In placing the offender on parole, Minister Lamola has said, our parole system is not a wanton license for unaccountability and impunity. Neither does it nullify the sentence or verdict of a court of law. The department says Walus will serve two years under community corrections in line with the parole regime upon which he is released. The Constitutional Court's decision has, however, left many enraged. The CCP and its alliance partners wanted Walus to rot in jail for the rest of his life, but this would have left the Justice Minister in contempt of court. The state has decided to give him parole, uh, which it is a sad moment, uh, especially for a black nation. He must tell us the honest truth, who send him. The family is still suffering even today. I mean, they haven't found the closure to say uh, who killed their father, their husband. The Constitutional Court has said he must be released, and that's what must happen, he must be released. 
The Justice and Correctional Services Department says the decision to deny him parole previously wasn't to avenge Hani's killing, but simply in the interest of justice. It added that there's no question that offender Walus is a polarizing figure and that his release has understandably reopened wounds among some people in the society, especially the late Hani's family. Mulimawane Mutaise, BC News, Pretoria. Well, of course, there has been a lot of reaction uh, to the turn of events uh, today among those uh, disappointed. Um, the South African Communist Party, which uh, issued a, a statement um, a little earlier saying they were disappointed. Um, of course, they're saying that together with their allies and other interested South Africans, um, uh, they will continue with their program of mobilization, which today they took uh, to Limbobo. They say they will not be deterred. They are going to continue with that program. Of course, also reminding us uh, that in response to the judgment, the SACP and the Hani family did file papers with the Constitutional Court to reconsider and rescind, uh, for, for, it, for the court to reconsider and rescind uh, that uh, decision. And among other things, they are demanding a full inquest into the assassination of Chris Hani to seek full disclosure of the truth, accountability, and justice. But also unhappy with today's turn of events is the EFF, whose spokesperson Snao Tambo joins me in studio. Snao, good evening. Thanks very much um, for your time. I mean, you have also added yours to the numerous voices that uh, didn't like this decision from the very uh, start. Yeah, I think uh, to say that we are unhappy or didn't like the decision would be to put it lightly. We are disgusted. We are appalled by the decision to release the murder of the chief of staff of Mkondo SCs when an anti-apartheid hero in society, uh, Comrade Chris Hani. Uh, the release of Yanus Walus is diabolical in our view. It undermines uh, all natural forms of justice. It spits in the face of those who died for the struggle to liberate us and give us the political freedoms we enjoy today. It's a spit in the face of the Hani family. And uh, it's a reflection that uh, our judiciary is still servicing colonial benefactors, it's still servicing those who oppressed us and continue to celebrate uh, the victories they waged in terms of assassinating Chris Arne. So it's going to entrench the arrogance of white supremacists, and uh, it's painful. And uh, as the EFF, uh, it's a decision that we view as regressive, uh, diabolical, and as hurtful and harmful. Because Yanis Walus has never showed any remorse for murdering Chris Arne. He was a right-wing a uh, person who murdered him for the ideas that he held, murdered him for his ideas of free education, free health care, free housing and sanitation, murdered him because Chris Hani believed in socialism. Mm -hmm. And that is the person that is today walking the streets of South Africa, which is why we have said that the people of South Africa must do as they please mm -hmm. with Yanus Walus. He must be the most uncomfortable man in this country. He must be the most uncomfortable person. It must be difficult for him to get groceries. It must be difficult for him to walk on our streets because the bullet that he shot to Chris and he shattered our dreams and shattered our hopes of liberation and the return of our land. And I mean, to the argument that, well, like anyone else, uh, he, he qualified for parole and was eventually um, paroled. What applies to everyone else should also apply to Janus Walus. Look, I think it re it's a reflection on the need to transform of our law to transform our law rather, but also be able to read certain situations within their political context. Yanus Walus took South Africa to the brink of civil war on the eve of democracy. That is beyond treasonous. It is beyond a betrayal of our people. It is something that may have staggered or stunted the future of this country for generations to come. We don't know the impact that Yanus Walus is made of Chris Hani has had in society today. We don't know where we would be today if Chris Hani was alive. He would have certainly been the president of this country. There would certainly have been massive and radicalized change in the lives of our people in terms of the conditions which they live in. So we now have been robbed of potential in the leader that Chris Hani was. We've been robbed of the opportunity to have a society that is characterized by socialism, that has detached itself from capitalism and market fundamentalism, which is currently rampant through the privatization of state-owned enterprises and the surrendering of our sovereignty to the IMF and the World Bank. So uh, Chris Hani was a gift that was stolen from us by Anus Walus, and that is the impact his death has had uh, on our society. So our law must be responsive to that reality. But I mean, is, does that not then uh, put a responsibility on your legislators, of which um, you have many in, in the, in the 
national legislature because what in your statement you call a rigid interpretation of the law someone else will tell you that it is actually the actual interpretation um, of the law um, you know and and no more no less Look, it does not mean that there should not be alterations uh, to our law. I mean, as the FF is part and parcel of many progressive changes to our law, the Section 89 panel, which is currently happening, is a product of a court case between the EFF and the Speaker of Parliament. So we contribute to the review of judicial uh, uh, jurisprudence, rather, on a constant basis. We are the ones who are calling for the land expropriation or the compensation because the Constitution itself allows for its amendment. So it's not to say that our laws should not be altered. And uh, of course, uh, the EFF will and should and will continue to form part and parcel of that. But perhaps it's an indignation on the African National Congress, which is leading the tripartite alliance, that it never reformed our laws to have a specific attention on apartheid aggressors, Eugene de Kock, uh, Janus Walus, and many of those, Rolf Meyer, who was within the ranks of the ANC for a very long time. Those apartheid apologists and orchestrators of apartheid, architects of apartheid that Chris Hani spoke so bitterly about, were never punished because of the ruling party's reluctance to make sure that justice prevails over reconciliation, that justice is defined by, but that reconciliation rather is defined by justice and not just simple uh, moving on for the sake of it. So there must be an indignation on the leader of the tripartite alliance because this situation, the release of Eugene de Kock, the existence of Vote Person, the existence of Janus Walus in our society is because the liberation movement has abandoned justice. So now, Tambo, let's leave it there for this evening. Thank you very much uh, for your time. Uh, listening in to that conversation and joining us now on the line is uh, Ntabi Seng Tubazana, who is a lawyer. Ntabi Seng, good evening. Thanks very much uh, for your time. For what um, Justice and Correctional Services uh, were telling us earlier today, they had no option whatsoever uh, to not release um, Janus Walus would have been in contempt of court. Are they correct? 100%. They're correct in that had they not released him, we would be sitting with a situation where Correctional Services is now dealing with the contempt of court issue. Um, in fact, they were mandated by the Constitutional Court to say that not only are you supposed to release um, the, 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 the parolee, but also give um, conditions for the parole within a certain number of days. Unfortunately, he got stabbed and then as a result, certain things happened and then he couldn't be released within the 10-day period. But once he he was healthy enough to leave the prison, he had to be released. Otherwise, they would be dealing with a whole other situation whereby they're in contempt of court. Well, I mean, of course, I mean, the uh, South African Communist Party um, is reminded us in a response, uh, I mean, subsequent to, I mean, his, his release, uh, that they have filed papers with the Constitutional Court asking it to reconsider um, its, its decision and to rescind it. So in order for a court to rescind its judgment, right, so the, we are basing it on the fact that they aired, the court aired in law uh, and that the judgment that was given was very wrong in law. So now when we look at the sections which the court was basing its judgment on, so we're basing it on section 86 and section 136, if I'm not mistaken. Now, both of those sections, one was first um, in terms of the Correctional Services Act, um, one was firstly established in the year 2004, and then another one in the year 2008, if I'm not mistaken. Now, as a result, by then, the death sentence for the detainee, Mr. Wallace, was then changed in the year 2000 to be that of a life imprisonment. Mm -hmm. So when we look at how the laws were, were then changed in order to change from death penalty to life sentence and all of the things that are applicable in terms of those particular sections, the acts do not give one that these changes had to apply retrospectively. That's the first thing. Wherein, when it comes to parole specifically, that those changes were supposed to apply retrospectively. And if you take a close look at those sections, they give the minister the right to recommend or even grant parole or refuse parole based on the interest of justice or whatever reasons that he or she may choose or may deem to be um, important in, in, not, um, in not granting parole. But now the court has made it seem as if that power also vests within a court. That is essentially saying, now, okay, the way the court has phrased it, they're essentially saying, 
that if in a high court, Ntabiseng is sentenced for life imprisonment for whatever crime, if we take this current decision, it means that the, the Corn Court has become a court of review and a court of appeal without mm. going through the normal processes. Mm. I can now get that Corn Court decision and say, no, wait, based on this Corn Court decision, I have a right to have my parole situations overturned based on what this court has done today, which is going to cause us problems going forward, to be quite honest. In, in fact, I mean, uh, the more we see uh, many of these cases coming forward, um, you know, the more uh, one gets a sense that there is a lot of uh, work that needs to be done um, in on the like in the in the, in the parole space. I mean, uh, the mm. uh, I mean, Arthur Fraser's uh, release, you know, or decision to release uh, former President Jacob Zuma is is one case in point. And last week, speaking mm. to the SACP about this. Um, um, a very case. They were citing a, 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 a number of things. Among them, uh, they were arguing, for example, that um, this guy didn't uh, fully disclose and he never really made any effort to actually reach out um, to the family uh, so that the family can ask him some questions, satisfy themselves, mm. um, uh, you know, um, and, and so on. The one time, I think the General Secretary of this SACP was saying that day that the one time they tried to do that, they did get an answer that uh, she was not available. She was in Cuba somewhere where she and her husband, uh, her late husband, were being honored and therefore could not be um, in, in the country. But someone, the way they put it, uh, simply ticked the box and then uh, went ahead and uh, started embarking on the process that has led to him uh, now being, being paroled. Uh, I, I'm sure you'd and uh, agree that uh, I mean there's a, there's a, there's a lot of loose ends here that need to be tied, and until you do that, um, these kinds of uh, situations are going to to arise. You are so correct, Voyo. Um, I don't even know how to not even. Uh, concur with what you're saying. So we have to now look it back from the time that the court of call gave the sentence. The court of call gave the sentence of death penalty. It was only overturned because of the democratic um, change that was happening within the country and because of the Makwanyani case whereby the death penalty was abolished. So now it had to be overturned from that to, to, to uh, um, what is this, a life sentence. Now, it is important, in fact, it is imperative for a court when sentencing in now our democracy to say whether or not an accused does qualify for parole after having served a certain amount of years. Now, in this situation, this was never done, mm. you know? So which means that, um, rather, I beg your pardon, it was at a point where by, in the death situation, when it was overturned, he didn't qualify for parole because this had not come into operation as yet, which means, technically speaking, he had no right to parole, to be quite honest, because the act didn't apply retrospectively to him. Now, if we're going to now go into what we're dealing with in terms of parole now and how it applies today, it is such an integral part of parole to not only look at the interest of justice, to not only look at the rehabilitation mm -hmm. of the accused, but also to have the victim um, offender dialogues. Mm -hmm. um, if the victim is still is not alive, then we deal with the family of the victim to see the comfort zones, to get some kind of closure, if yeah. you will, from the accused person. And this, as you have said clearly, it has never happened. Mm. Ibile Mehani has also said that this has never happened. So how then did the court decide to overlook all of these steps yes. and make a decision and say, you know what, he qualifies for parole and therefore he must be re released, even though we know it's going to open wounds mm. uh, for a lot of people. But, you know, the Constitution says it must be done. I, I, I feel like the courts overstepped a little bit, even though it is the apex court. They did not understand clearly what the act has to say in yes. that regard. We will see, of course, what uh, the SACP and Nani family application, uh, how that is going to pan out. But thank you so much, Ntabi Seng, for your time and insights this evening. And that's our show for tonight. To so join us again tomorrow evening, same time, from the Watchdog team. Have a good night.